Thank you. I, I say that I have professional ADD, you know, I just get finding, founding things and handing them off. But by the way, if you ever want to be a grandmother prematurely, just found an organization and then hand it off to, you know, a staff and a board and watch them run with it. And it's just, it's just wonderful. Um, I just want to say a couple words about the Baltimore Orchard Project, which is why I think I was um, invited for this session. But then I want to speak about what motivated me to create the Baltimore Orchard Project, the underlying um, foundation, theoretical foundation. So the Baltimore Orchard Project has been in existence for about seven years now, and its goal is to bring fruit to common areas, commonly owned areas in uh, Baltimore City, mostly in the areas where, can you, uh, can you take these lights down a teeny bit so I can see the audience just a little better? Is that possible? And if you could, that would be great. Um, and what we do is we work with, not, f not for, but we work with, oh, okay, that's another way of doing it. <laughs> um, we work with um, communities in Baltimore City mostly, um, congregations, schools, neighborhood associations that own or at least have the rights to manage uh, communal space, uh, which is now either degraded um, or just vacant, um, otherwise underutilized. Um, and what we do is we say, why not take what is seen as um, a sort of a detriment to the community, you know, something that is not being productive, something that actually can invite um, either vermin or other um, un unwelcome activities and turn it into an asset. You know, one of the things we wanted to say is that this vacancy it's an asset, it's not a blight, it's an asset that's just not being realized. And then we work with them and um, it's not just orchards. I said we ain't just trees. In order to have healthy orchards, you need healthy soil, you need um, a bio, you know, an environment, you need an ecology, you need smaller plants, you need um, what they call guilds of plants so that you will bring the right, um, right insects uh, to do the pollination and, and repel the, the wrong kinds of insects. And so what we do is we actually take places that otherwise are overlooked um, or, as I say, sort of badly used, and turn them into green spaces. And we, in the process, open people's hearts to saying, oh, you know what, nature's not out there. <clears throat> you know, nature's not just something out there, but it's right here. And not only is it right here, it's something that I can absolutely interact with. And what's, we have about 100 orchards now, so that means we have 100 partners. Um, we have harvested from, pre -ex from existing fruit trees that people otherwise like to chop down because they think it's messy when the fruit drops. You know, we say, well, let's, I, I tell you what we can do about that dropping fruit, let's harvest it. You know, <laughs> maybe if we, if we get it first, then we can give it away. We've given away um, 15,000 pounds of, of urban fruit that would otherwise go to waste and also just um, you know, sort of litter, litter the ground. Um, but we also um, are, as I say, changing people's hearts and minds. It's wonderful and very difficult, by the way, to get people to embrace orchards. In gardens, if you plant in March, you've got something to harvest, you know, in May or June. But you take a tree and you put it in the ground and you mulch it and you water it and you bless it and you watch it and then you wait. <laughs> and one of the things that we do is we teach these children especially um, the virtue of patience and a vision of the future, because many of them don't have visions of the future. And we can teach them that over the course, uh, actually, of a school year, because if we plant in the fall, and then we come back, and we measure them, by the way, we measure them and we measure their tree. <laughs> And then we come back in the spring, or we come back the following fall, and that tree has grown in a significant way that you can measure. And they haven't always grown as much. It's always interesting to, to see. But they sort of own the growth and the potential future of the tree. And they believe in a future, which is really quite, quite wonderful. So they believe in the sense of engaging at nature right here in the city. And we also teach them, by the way, why don't people ever plant, like, say, gardens right there, or why, why was that land vacant? Because people often are afraid that it's, um, it's tainted, it's toxic, who knows what lead or whatever. And we say, you know what trees do? Fruit trees, as well as other trees? Fruit trees will sequester the toxins in that poison soil. So it will not only give you a healthy piece of fruit you can be comfortable eating, but it, in fact, in the process, cleanses the environment for them. And you want that to be cleansed, not just because you, know, you don't want the fruits to be poisoned, but if there's lead for something in that soil and kids play in it, they can get poisoned just by playing in that vacant lot. So we do so many things to rejuvenate these communities 
And, um, and having these children come back year after year to see the growth of their tree is quite, quite rewarding. But what, what motivated me to do this? Um, there's a phrase in Psalm, Psalm 119, and it says, Ger anochi ba'aretz. I am a stranger. I am a sojourner. I am a guest on this earth. And I have to tell you, I have been so moved by this concept of being just a guest on this earth, that we are all fleeting. You know, we are all transient. We are only here temporarily. And what hubris does it take for us to think that we can so transform the earth in the short span of time that we are here to our liking for our selfish purposes and not think about First, the gift that was given to us by others who didn't ruin the earth and those who come after us. What hubris that is. I really sometimes can't sleep at night for the selfishness <laughs> that, that, that makes me think we, we are living. So we are, we, did, we, we didn't create this world. We didn't dream up this world. We didn't forge this world. We only have a right to use it lovingly and to use it in a way that, like the tree, will improve it and give gifts to others. We are here as um, a sort of unconditional but unearned guests of the earth. You know, we, we didn't earn <laughs> to be born. We didn't earn the gift of our family. We didn't earn the gift of community. We didn't earn the gift of culture and wisdom and, and science. We, we are gifted at, and we then therefore have to understand um, how to answer two very important questions. How shall we be good guests? And then in turn, how shall we be good hosts? And actually, etymologically, if you go back to the root, guest and host is one word. It's a common word. Why? You can't have one without the other is one thing. And two, because once you are gifted as a guest, there is an obligation to turn around and be host to others. So what does it take to be a good guest? Um, one is to be grateful especially if it's unearned guestness, right? To be grateful for whatever comes to you. Um, to be satisfied with enough, you know? Just, just if you are given something and it is sufficient, it's not exorbitant, it's not abundant, it's not over the top, it's just sufficient. The blessedness of sufficiency. Um, Mary Poppins, one of the great rabb rabbinic scholars, you know, of the world. <laughs> Mary Poppins said, do you remember this? Um, Enough is as good as a feast. She says it very fast. It's almost hard to see in the, in the movie. But enough is as good as a feast. Just sufficiency is, just, is, is, is enough to fill us. We should have gratitude. Um, we should travel lightly. If you're moving around, you don't want to schlep a lot of luggage. So for your own sake, you should travel lightly. But also for those around you, you don't want to burden them with all of the, the emotional, the physical, um, ecological garbage that you might, that you might be um, carrying with you. You have to be forgiving. You know, your host isn't going to be perfect. <laughs> Hosts are human too, and they're going to make mistakes, and they're not always going to be as responsive to you. So to be a guest is to learn to be gracious in the sense not just of gratefulness, but to be forgiving, you know, of, of the other, um, which means making room for the other, by the way. And it's on to be a good, good guest is to offer to offer thanks. So that's being a good guest. What does it take to be a good host? Um, hospitality is about letting go, about giving up what you believe is categorically yours. It's about having and knowing that you are so blessed to have that you can share. Being a host is a gift. If you can't if you, if you don't host, if you don't have things to host with, you are bereft. As someone, as something that I read said, if you, if you don't welcome pe people into your home, if you don't host, then all you have is, a, is an address, you know, and not a home, right? It's a, it's a place, but it doesn't, it doesn't open itself up. Um, hosting teaches us to accept imperfections in ourselves and in others. There's... Being a hosting guest, and yeah, we could spend a whole seminar on just what does it mean to be the good ghost, good ghost, good guest. 
maybe someone's trying to talk through me, right? <laughs> um, a good guest and a good host. So in thinking about this being a rabbi, I obviously go to my tradition, and in my tradition, it was very interesting. I saw two ways um, of being a guest, of offering, two ways of being a host, of offering hospitality. And they're reflected in agricultural practices, which is why I'm spending so much time on that here. So the one way of being a host is um, in the, 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 the Jewish word tzimtzum. It is to withdraw. It is to make room for somebody by pulling yourself in. It's what we do when we move over on a bench, right? It's what we do when we stop speaking and you allow somebody else to, to step into the silence. It's what we do when we say, we shouldn't own all of this. For now, I will cede some of what I own and I will lend it to you. So tzimtzum is a way to be a host. The Kabbalists, the mystics of Jew Judaism, say that that's how God created the world. Because in the beginning, God filled the world. There was an enormity of godness, and that was the universe. And in order to make room for us to survive, to live, to, to, to be free to move, God had to withdraw, which is it's astonishing because most of the time we want to say how God is present in the world, and God is. But the Kabbalists said God also had to make room for us. If God can make room for us, then surely we can make room for others. And those, the peya leket shichacha that I spoke about this morning, those three ways of agricultural um, humility, where you give the corners of your field over to the poor, where you don't pick up what you dropped because it meant that you had too much anyway, where you leave behind what you forgot. That's a sort of tzimtzum. That's a way of saying, I understand I don't own all this land, that I am sharing it with others, and I will withdraw and let others share the land with me. But the other type of hospitality is har chava is opening up, is welcoming in. We also do this on a daily basis. Women in pregnancy create space where there wasn't before by opening up. Um, you can stand here and talk to somebody, but when they want to give you a hug, all of a sudden there is this space in which you enter that didn't exist before. Or, or when a child wants to be hugged, you uncross your legs and you create a lap. You open yourself up. And agriculturally, Judaism says that by the sabbatical year, the Shemitah year, the seventh year, just as we have a weekly cycle of six days and a Sabbath, the Bible says that we should have a, uh, a yearly seven-year cycle of six years and a seventh year of rest. And by the way, that has been going on since the biblical period until today. We still have in the Jewish calendar a, year, a cycle of six years of normal, hopefully restorative and healthy work, but a seventh year of rest. Shemitah year, the seventh year of rest, agriculturally means that my fields that I own, that I plow, that I work, that I put fences around are no longer my fields. In that one year, my fields be revert back to the way of the commons. The earth is owned by everyone, and it is only because of necessity that we carve it up into, into, into segments so that we each can work it. And when we so believe that we own that space, as William Blackstone said, a sort of, you know, an English um, economist long ago, said that we believe that we own that as dis in despotic dominion, that we have a right to exclude others and do whatever we want on that space, that's when things start going awry. And that's where economy and ecology just merge together to, to, to ruin the environment and therefore the social world in which we live. And what the Shemitah year says is that every seventh year, you have to release what you own. It is literally a release. You have to release what you own. Tear down your fences. Let everyone come to your land the same way that you come to your land now. Return the land to the commons. And the Bible says what you might say. Well, what are we going to live on? <laughs> what are we going to eat? And the Bible says um, the land will provide and God will provide. How will the land provide? The land will only provide because during those six years we have been so nourishing of the land, right? Not destroying the land by over, you know, by over fertilizing it and all, but we have been doing like the trees, we have been restoring the land so that the seventh year is actually not a land where the, not a year where the land has to lie fallow because it's been overused and over abused. Rather, the seventh year is a land of abundance where we can all live without the land even being needing to work, to be worked because it is so rich and abundant. It's a hard sell 
<laughs> but what I love about it is that what it says is that every seven years, you are reminded that you are a guest and that you have responsibilities to the land. And I'm just going to go like one minute over because in addition to that Shemitah year saying that you no longer own that land and it is returned back to the commons and we all have equal access and equal ownership and equal claim to the earth, which is the way we started. <laughs> um, there's also an economic component. All debts are erased. It is a reset. It is a reset in the, on the use of the land. It's a reset in the economy. And here's the thing. It doesn't only come every seven years. If in year two you come to me and say, I'd like a loan. Nina, would you give me a loan? <laughs> I'm going to say, well, let me see. This is year two, three, four, five. I'm going to know. I'm going to know that in another, set, you know, another four or five years, I'm going to have to release my land. And you will either have given me back my loan or I will have to release that too. But the thing is, we all get a reset. It's all, we're, all, we're all down back again to, um, to being equal in owning and understanding that we all own the earth in commons. And then the year after the Shemitah year, we go back to, to that ownership, to the private ownership, but hopefully better aware of the fact that this is temporary. And we all owe each other the sense of taking care of each other and taking care of the land and taking care of the economy and taking care of land, economy, and each other all go together. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Um, I was struck by, well, everything, of course, <laughs> but um, could you speak a little more about the faith traditions and the sense of stewardship uh, to the earth? Um, Yes. <laughs> I know, that's a huge subject. Um, well, it is, it is a huge subject, and um, I was reading something by uh, Wendell Berry just the other day mm -hmm. <clears throat> who, um, helped, who helped explain in Genesis, our calling is to take care of the earth. Genesis 2 tells us that we are created. Why did God create humanity? According to Genesis, God created humanity. Excuse me, I gotta, might want to cut the mic for a sec. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <coughs> okay, we're good. Thank you. Some water. <laughs> want some water? Want some water? That's all right. I'll take it in a second. Um, God created humanity because there were two things that earth was missing. Rain and someone to take care of the earth. So God wanted someone to take care of the earth. God would provide the rain, right? And then... God would provide um, humanity to take care of the earth. And that we are, we are put on the surf, let of da ul shamra, to work it. Because I mean, as your dad says, you know, you got to you work the earth, the earth, right? But to, but, to be, but to take care of it, to steward it, to be precious with it, right? They go hand in hand. It's like a yin-yang thing, or I don't know what we from your tradition does put this all together. Um, but your father also said, but that's, that's, that's sort of in the ideal, that's the mythic, that's the, that's the Eden version of things. And then he, he, he talks about you know, Leviticus and, the, and, and in the land, when the Jews went into the land of Israel, these cyclical years, seven-year cycles, remind us that we are stewards, yes, but even more, I find more powerful that we're guests. Mm -hmm. And you do not go into somebody's home and leave their home worse off than, you know, when, when, you, when you got there, you, you leave, your home, leave their home at least as beautiful, if not even a little better. You bring gifts um, when you're guests. And we should imagine ourselves as bringing gifts to the earth, and that's a stewardship too. Yes. It's astonishing in a century we've managed to basically wipe out so many of the wild creatures and planet and air and water because of our patterns of living and consumption, which came up yesterday. And in your tradition, tradition too, there must be um, uh, in the Quran um, obviously talk of stewardship on the earth and, and such. Is there something that you could share about that as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. in the Quran we have a lot of verses and, 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 and uh, in our tradition, land, uh, nature, animals um, are, as, are mentioned many times in, 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 uh, in our verses. And um, we have this um, the body is considered as a trust, so we have we must to take care of it. It's not our body; <laughs> it was just for. And and um, and there is also another 
you mentioned we're here like as a guest, and, and it's uh, we have one of my teacher uh, put in different ways. He he, he says that um, this world is is not our paradise; mm -hmm. it's the paradise of animals. And uh, yeah, mm. I find it very interesting to <laughs> to <laughs> also guest. <laughs> traditions limit us. <laughs> They provide us a context to live in that limit the harm mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. should do, and somehow that's failed mm -hmm. here. Exactly. Well, because our culture has taught us that we can be limitless in many right. ways, right? That we can do whatever we want, and mm -hmm. again, this notion of progress and that modern whatever technology mm -hmm. or the other isms you want to believe in is going to make it so we can do whatever we want. Well, the idea um, of being all you can be means you're going to have to move somebody out of the way, right. doesn't it? But also with the economic externalities where we make things yes. and then we, we ignore the, 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 the offshooting of it and we, we make others pay for it, both with their health and with their money. We, we aren't responsible. We're not good guests. We're not responsible for what we, one, for what we do, but two, the other thing is, and I'm sure you're going to be talking about this too, um, one of the stunning lessons that I learned is that nature knows no waste. That is, it totally recycles. This concept of waste or excess or um, something that, that, that is sort of beyond the normal um, just realm is just and then you can throw things away. It's just not a natural concept. And we so imbibe that. As long as our trash cans, that's great. We put it in the trash can and we're good. Even in recycling, put it in the recycling. Then, you know, you know, like that's good. But we don't imagine the full life cycle of what these are. And, and if we understood that there is no such thing as waste, everything comes back, everything ends up in us, everything ends up in the environment, we would, from the time we dreamed of creating something, which we should do, dream of creating things, we would dream of creating how it goes throughout its, its entire life cycle. Right. And when we're in harmony with nature, there is that circular pattern, right, as you say, with no waste, mm -hmm. versus today the paradigm, and I hate to bring this up, but it's, it's <laughs> frankly, you know, we have, the other day I was speaking with someone about saying, oh, there's this great way we can take all the methane of the cattle that are in these, what we call concentrated, you know, feedlots, and make that into some regenerative kind of energy. Mm. But thinking of the insanity of even just thinking, and first of all, we're creating a waste that we wouldn't be creating if we were really using those animals or living with those animals in a proper relationship, right? So we've gotten so disconnected, I think, sometimes of, of how, what things can be, mm -hmm. that there doesn't need to be waste, that it's twisted our whole notion of even what is recyclable and things like that, right? So, um, okay, we'll continue this discussion and Mary is going to add an yet another level upon it.